Our next speaker is Chris Riopel, uh, who has traveled here from London, where he serves as the uh, curator of post-1800 paintings and acting curator of French 18th century paintings at the National Gallery. Uh, he's had a distinguished career at the National Gallery, but before that he was here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and at the Getty. And um, he is educated here in New York, I believe, but originally from Canada. And I think it's terrific to have someone from this side of the Atlantic running things at the National Gallery in London. Um, in that cap capacity, he's uh, pr uh, curated exhibitions by uh, Kobka, um, and of course by Balka, which he co-curated with Knut and Marit. And also he was responsible for the exhibition um, of uh, the collection of Osborne and Lunde, which was presented in 2012. Please welcome Chris Riopel. Now, when it comes to presenting an artist new to the vast majority of the public, you will be presenting the artist to any curator worth his salt or her salt, uh, when they see a good idea, steals it. Uh, and that was certainly the case uh, at the National Gallery in London when we went up for the opening of our exhibition in uh, Trumsa. Uh, we were immediately struck by Knut's brilliance of, in beginning the exhibition by filling one room, quite simply, with four depictions of the North Cape. Uh, one, the earliest one to survive, two other points throughout the career, and then the last known to us. It was brilliant because as you began, there was the whole career adumbrated for you in terms of a single image to which the artist kept returning and on which he kept ringing the changes. It established the whole, if you will, problematic of Balka, why was he doing it? Why was he making these changes? What are the implications for it? And so uh, we uh, uh, very much stole that idea uh, in, the, uh, in the London exhibition you see at the upper left, our opening room as well, consisted of, I think it was those same four, uh, those same four paintings that told you the story we were about to see that then got filled in as you moved through the spaces uh, 62 pictures in uh, this case, and over and over again, almost like a Wagnerian light motif, you came upon this image of the North Cape, this image deriving uh, from that epical voyage in the spring and summer of 1832 up the west coast of Norway, the first artist really uh, to make it for aesthetic purposes, if we can put it that way, going as far as the North Cape and indeed further, uh, as we know, and identifying there uh, this extraordinarily powerful motif, this great hunk of rock uh, shooting out into the sea with its very, very distinctive uh, notch in the middle uh, of it, uh, a, a mountain whose profile is absolutely as distinctive as Cezanne's uh, Mont Saint Victoire is distinctive. You come to recognize it uh, everywhere. And what I want to do today then is to look at the ways uh, in which he changed his depiction of uh, that rock formation and to speculate on what it might have mean, meant. Uh, this picture is our constant reference in our discussions of, uh, of Belka, the earliest of the North Cape to uh, survive from 1845, uh, a picture that, as Knut pointed out, is already, and Asher already pointed out, is already a memory picture. It is 13 years after the, um, after the trip uh, up the west coast of Norway. It has had a long time uh, to settle uh, in his mind of how he, Balka, wishes to portray it. Uh, it is also a work of 1845, that is, again, as we've heard, immediately following his apprenticeship, if you will, in Dresden with his teacher, uh, Johann Christian Dahl, and with Dahl's great friend and neighbor, uh, Caspar David Friedrich. He was there immersed uh, in their art, 
And this picture is absolutely in keeping with the tenets of their teaching. They had no problem with memory painting at all. That is what it was supposed to be. In what you did was collect motifs by going up to the North Cape or wherever, making sketches, making oil sketches, having them with you for reference, and then in the sanctity, in the solitude of the studio, in the fullness of time, being able to contemplate what you had seen, being able to synthesize what you had uh, seen, being able to evoke it within an atmospheric envelope, if we can say it uh, in uh, that way, and then within the studio to create it uh, anew. For um, uh, this was exactly uh, Friedrichs and indeed um, uh, Dahl's procedure, carrying it to a higher, indeed, spiritual realm. But for them, the dedication to naturalistic detail, the dedication to mimesis, that what you depict ought to look very much like uh, what you are depicting and ought to do so in detail remained central to their thinking about art. And you remember, you, uh, it's a wonderful letter when um, uh, Dahl is writing to his most, one of his most talented students, Fernley, and says, Fernley, I don't want you to give up the, Nor the Norwegian motif. Continue to paint the Norwegian motif. And Fernley wonderfully answered, yes, I will continue to paint the Norwegian motif so long as I can stay in Italy to do it. <laughs> but uh, Dahl had no problem with this because... Uh, Fernley was remembering, was referring to his sketches, and was continuing to paint in a mimetic, highly naturalistic manner. What happens, though, when you decide that you can give up that category of naturalism, you can give up uh, uh, mimesis and move more and more relentlessly toward evocation rather than uh, truthful depiction? And I think it's the picture Marit ended on. Uh, I think we can trace the exact moment as when this possibility begins to emerge uh, for Balka that he can move away from the Dahl precepts of how you do this thing. And indeed, Dahl saw it coming. He said, oh, Balka, he'll go off in his own way. Uh, and indeed he did. But I think that the greatest commission of his life and the greatest failure of his life, the commission of 1847 from Louis Philippe, the king of the French, for 33 paintings um, uh, on Norwegian scenes, was uh, the commission was, of course, uh, never executed in full because the following year, Louis Philippe is overthrown in the revolution of 1848, flees to England. But when he receives the commission, Balkan knows that only he, 15 years earlier, had seen this site, and one other person, Louis Philippe himself, 50 years earlier, when in, uh, in the late uh, 1790s, escaping uh, the worst excesses of the French Revolution, on which he had participated earlier on, uh, Louis Philippe, Duc d'Orléans, travels to Norway, travels as far as the North Cape, and now, 50 years later, is commissioning this young, and one gathers very charming young artist, to recall that voyage for him. And this, uh, in a small scale, is Balka's proposal for a big painting on the North Cape, on this highly uh, distinctive uh, motif that may indeed be Louis Philippe himself gesticulating in the foreground. Uh, but of course, the picture itself has become a far more stylized, a far more evocative image than the one we saw before. The envelope of atmosphere, the almost monochromatic uh, coloring of the painting is carrying it a very, the, and also the emphasis on light effects, carrying it a very far way, way from the still uh, naturalistic, romantic, sublime image of only a few years later. Uh, and that, I think, that process of being able to move away uh, from uh, mimesis uh, marks a very important step in uh, Balka's, uh, Balka's uh, development. We see in works like this the same tendency to, uh, to exaggerate the 
participation of the sky, the, the uh, uh, pathetic fallacy, as it were, that, uh, that nature clouds the, the very light falling on the, uh, on the cliff is participating in somehow defining the meaning of, uh, of, uh, of this great rock, and the simplification, indeed, that the rock begins to take, uh, take on. That is, is certainly true uh, in other images that, uh, that we have seen and that are so beautifully presented in the exhibition at the, uh, at the Met, where also the North Cape imagery serves as a kind of light motif to pull you through the, uh, the whole exhibition. Uh, and then you get to these uh, even later things uh, where the stylization of, uh, of uh, the cliff uh, and the role of the sun, of sunlight, uh, of light coming down on the water under this, as I think uh, uh, Asher called it, dome of light that now encompasses it, pulls him, pulls Balka further and further uh, away. The North Cape itself is becoming a kind of sign of, of itself in these pictures and pictures such as uh, this. And then uh, it, in the 1860s, by which point he has now, of course, retired, if we can use that word, retired from being officially uh, a painter more and more involved in politics, more and more involved in uh, real estate development in and around uh, Oslo, in and around Christiania, and yet continues to, to carry on in his investigation of what can be done uh, with painting, but now the emphasis becomes more and more on the technical aspects, what experimentally he can do to evoke, in this case, this image of the North Cape. And we've seen how here in this extraordinary picture, the North Cape itself is not represented. There is no line outlining it. We only see it in its negative, that is from the area scraped away to show the paint on the top of, uh, of, the, um, of the mountain. Uh, it's, very, it's interesting to speculate at uh, this time on the relationship with photography, the, the role that negatives were coming to play in photography and allowing the infinite replication of uh, an image, and also the role of photography uh, perhaps in uh, Belka's move away from color into black and white and, uh, and gray. But that's a subject for another day, a subject that needs developing. But this sense of experimentation uh, on the surface of the painting becomes ever more important for him in the later years, in the years of uh, retirement. And that is certainly true when you get to the very small, the very uh, uh, late uh, works which have, if I uh, may say, I think for um, people coming to Balka from in a place like New York with its strong modernist tradition uh, to which they're most immediately responding. What is going on in pictures like these where representation seems to be playing a secondary role uh, to the sheer manipulation of paint on a surface, he may well have been holding the uh, the uh, pieces of wood in his hand, allowing the thin washes of paint on the very smooth ground to move around until it begins to suggest a an image, a seascape image, uh, to him, uh, and then allowing it to set in that way. Perhaps as on the right, adding a few motifs like the birds, like the ship to turn it into a full-scale landscape. But over and over, and especially in the picture on the left, it is the sheer manipulation of paint, the flow of paint, the sense that that flow of paint is accidental or largely accidental that becomes fascinating. And of course, in the picture on uh, the right, in the lower right corner, uh, you see an enormous, given the scale of the painting, uh, an enormous thumbprint. Balka's thumbprint himself, his presence on the canvas. It also serves to shape and give definition and three-dimensionality to the rock into which the, the, um, the fingerprint has been pressed. But it is also uh, a way of establishing this surface as something on which the artist is acting in a very strong, in a very powerful uh, way. 
Uh, that is uh, certainly true as well in works like uh, this extraordinary picture with the comb dragged through the thin plate uh, from top to bottom and then across uh, the uh, across the uh, the bottom to suggest the waves of the sea, just really two broad movements into which then uh, the ships are placed. I should say that uh, when I first saw this picture, I was waxing very poetic about proto Picasso, proto synthetic cubism, the use of combs, etc. Uh, but my my director at the time, Nicholas Penny, said. It's a very old trick known to every house painter, known to every decorator, uh, um, known to every scene painter. But here he is seeing, and his formation was, of course, as a, a house painter, a decorator, he's seeing how he can use it uh, in, uh, in, to, in order to evoke very powerfully the northern lights in the most abbreviated and simple uh, manner. Now, these... Um, experiments with what you can do on a pictorial surface, with how you can apply the paint, how you can move it around, how you can move away from mimesis, and how you can still suggest uh, a form, suggest a subject with a minimum of means, was also coming to be explored by people who could not have known Balka's work, but come, uh, come of age, as it were, in his final years. And I show you uh, just an example of the extraordinary works from the 1870s of the Swede, Carl Frederick Hill, uh, working in France before his, his mental collapse, doing these paintings which eschew beauty uh, in, in favor of the simple physical application of paint in a very aggressive, a very uh, um, direct and physical way. Uh, as with Balka's work, you see a growing Nordic fascination with the application of, uh, of medium onto surface uh, in an almost, uh, almost abstract manner. The same is certainly true a few years later with the most extraordinary of the Nordic artists of that generation, uh, August Strindberg. Strindberg, who understood that you could still evoke landscape, you could still say this is, uh, this is a landscape, this represents something in nature, but now reduced to almost degree zero. It's just the lines across the middle suggesting hills, horizon, uh, et cetera, uh, that tell you it's a landscape, that he's telling you it's a landscape. But the fascination, perhaps particularly for us, uh, now a century and more later, lies in that physical manipulation of medium on, uh, on uh, a surface that would become a, uh, again, leitmotif of uh, Nordic uh, modernism. Certainly that, uh, that similar manipulation you see in, in this uh, quite late uh, evocation, yet again, of the, um, of, uh, the North Cape. And I, if not going too far, and here I must say my I, very great debt uh, I owe to the Austrian scholar Dieter Buchhand, uh, the first man ever to do an exhibition in Balka outside of Scandinavia 10 years ago at Krems in Austria did an extraordinary exhibition called uh, Balka, Pioneer of Modernism, uh, in wh and who is also himself a formidable scholar of uh, Edvard Munch, uh, making the relationship between uh, what Munch would be doing uh, and what, um, what Balka did uh, some 30 years earlier. I show you this extraordinary photograph of Munch on the beach, on the strand, more or less naked. Behind him, one of his paintings, unstretched, flapping there in the wind, allowing the wind, the sand, the water, allowing nature itself to participate in the making of what would turn out to be very ghostly images, but in which nature and the processes of nature are implicated in what it is the, uh, the artist actually does. Uh, and that carries us back just to end to this picture, the last known uh, uh, representation of the North Cape by, uh, by Belka, probably from the, uh, from the 1870s, after painting for what seems for a decade or more very tiny works on wood, perhaps likely painted in his hand, here all of a sudden he paints 
the largest image of the uh, North KP ever did on, uh, on canvas with these very, very thin washes of color as if nature itself had, uh, had um, partially erased it from our, uh, from our view so that the North Cape itself is just this floating form that we might not recognize if we had not known all the other representations uh, of the uh, North Cape. And it is also one, and I will end with that, uh, in which, uh, again, a uh, subject that keeps re-emerging, in which Balka allows uh, the image made by chance, that old trope leading back to Leonardo da Vinci, Alexander Cousins, whom we've seen, the image made by chance to fully inform the painting uh, in two places. And you see in the lower left, uh, and, and it's much clearer when you see the big painting uh, itself, a blotch of gray paint which turns into a bird, and in the very center of a painting, a blotch of paint that turns into the head of a dolphin. Some people may not agree that that is what they're say saying, but I uh, firmly uh, believe that, that, that Balka, in this late date, is allowing accidents of nature, accidents of paint, to direct what he is doing. And my final suggestion would be that while we have been looking at uh, Balka's important role in defining uh, sublime romantic uh, landscape painting, that it is also valuable, is also worthwhile to think of him as standing at the beginning of a tradition of painterly experimentation, of acting on the canvas, acting on the support with your media, uh, that would become such a distinctive characteristic of what we now call the Norder, Nordic modernist tradition, and that he can be looked at in that continuum as well. Thank you. <laughs>